the objective of the trim trial was to take advantage of an observation that had been made many years before and was largely ignored. And that was the observation that it was possible to regrow the thymus gland. So to explain that, the thymus is the master gland of the immune system. It processes cells that are derived from the bone marrow into immune cells that are able to defend us against bacteria, viruses, and cancer, and other things as well. Those are called T cells since they're educated in the thymus. And you need those T cells to stay alive. Now, unfortunately, the thymus begins to peter out. Uh, it becomes more and more replaced by fat as we get older. And so the process of producing T cells uh, wanes and the T cells themselves are apparently very long lived. They can live many years and perhaps decades, but eventually uh, not producing them leads to a deficiency. They, they don't last forever and they start to die out. Uh, and so therefore between the ages of 60 and 80, you lose about 98% of your ability to recognize foreign invaders and that's the age range in which everybody dies, just you know, by and large. That, that's that's when uh, age-related mortality really takes off, and I don't think that's a, a coincidence. Uh, we also know that the thymus is linked into other aging processes, including aging processes that affect the brain, the liver, uh, insulin signaling, all kinds of things. So the immune system has great significance beyond just immunity itself. And the idea that you could actually regrow the thymus after it is withered and almost died and thereby restore immunity was a very appealing idea to me. And since uh, no one else seemed to be taking that up, we wanted to try to do this in normal aging people. There had been a couple of doctors who had uh, in desperation treating uh, HIV AIDS patients whose immune systems were being eaten by the AIDS virus, the HIV virus. Uh, they tried using growth hormone to restore immune system function, they had a pretty good degree of success with that, but uh, that's a very small population and the thymus of those people is different from the thymus of you and me. So it wasn't really clear what would happen in older people. So we wanted to find out. So we, we uh, created a protocol uh, involving growth hormone, which is the same, same substance that was able to regrow the thymus in, in the original observations of many, many years ago and uh, two other agents because growth hormone has side effects. And I think one reason that growth hormone uh, has not you know, been a panacea against aging in, in the past is because it has these side effects, particularly it has some obvious side effects like joint uh, pain and things like that. But the, the real uh, important one in my view is the silent one that people don't notice or pay much attention to. And that is the so-called diabetogenic effect of growth hormone, which is a tendency for growth hormone to raise insulin levels. So we wanted to, we wanted to deliberately create a biological contradiction. We wanted to have the benefits of growth hormone, but, but interfere with that second function of growth hormone of raising insulin levels. So we did that in two ways. One, by reproducing a natural biological contradiction that occurs in everybody as they're young, uh, which is mediated by the hormone DHEA or dehydroepiandrosterone. And the significance of this is that in youth, we have very large amounts of growth hormone, we have very large amounts of DHEA, and we have very normal levels of insulin. We are not diabetics when we're young, so there has to be a reason for that. What's different about an old person who takes growth hormone and gets diabetes, essentially, versus a young person who doesn't? And I hypothesize that the reason that there's a difference is that the young person has DHEA. So we tried that. I tried it on myself several times, take growth hormone, mm -hmm. watch my D, my insulin level go up. And then on the same uh, dose of growth hormone, uh, take DHEA on top of that and watch my insulin level come right back down to normal. So having satisfied myself that at least it worked on me, we decided to try it in this uh, initial clinical trial. And, uh, in case that wasn't sufficient, we also added metformin because metformin is a wonderful drug uh, for increasing what is called insulin sensitivity, the ability of, of insulin to do whatever insulin wants to do. The beauty of that is that by, I mean, it's a little bit uh, paradoxical, but the beauty of that is by increasing the effectiveness of insulin, insulin concentrations in the bloodstream actually go down because you don't need as much insulin. So whatever insulin does, it's bad. You know, it, it may be uh, 
the, uh, the uh, areas of the body that uh, it's not very effective in uh, that, that uh, are the source of the problem. So if you increase uh, insulin effectiveness and you lower the concentration in the bloodstream, everything is much better. And one of the guidelines there is that calorie restriction has been known since 1935 to greatly extend lifespan of mammals. And the thing that's really striking to me about calorie restriction is that in that situation, both insulin and glucose are low at the same time, which means that one of the central features of calorie restriction for life extension is to enhance insulin sensitivity. In other words, insulin effectiveness so that insulin concentrations can go down. And so we were trying to mimic that as, as well as we could with TRIMP.